take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life and praise God in the darkness. Let God's word strengthen your heart. There should be a passion in our heart to tell everybody how they can come to know Jesus Christ. invite you to take your Bible and open to the book of Romans. You know we're studying Romans on Sunday evenings, and we're coming to Romans, and we're going to just camp out on one verse tonight. I think it, it's a verse that you all know very well, and it's kind of one of those verses that you can't pass over too lightly, because this is a verse that we all take comfort in. Look in Romans 8.28 tonight. Romans 8.28. Perhaps some of us could quote this by memory, but I want us to look at it and look at it in its context and apply it to us tonight. And I call this a promise of divine providence, or we could call it a principle of providence. This speaks to me about the providential work and hand of God in our life. So let me ask you a question. Did any of you, any of you had a hard year <laughs> this year or last year? I think all of us could say we've all had things happen in our life that, that have been difficult. Uh, the other day I was just kind of listing some things that I've been going through, and I, I thought this is not a good idea. I should stop. Um, but the truth of the matter is a, a lot of us go through difficult times. And then we hear verses like this, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And you might say to yourself, how can I give thanks for everything? I mean, we hear of terrible events that happen. We hear of parents who lose their children and horrible accidents. Uh, we, I've heard reports about that on the news. We hear of young people whose lives are suddenly taken. Uh, we hear of people losing their jobs and losing their homes. Uh, we hear of people that get a fatal illness. We hear of one tragedy after another. I spoke to a man who has uh, been out of a job for two years. He tried and tried to find employment. Finally, he found a job. And he went and he worked, and he wanted to work really hard and impress the bosses, and so he worked so very hard. But he worked so hard that he got a herniated disc in his back. And then his leg went numb, and it caused excruciating pain. And, and finally, the, uh, the company let him go. The company doctor couldn't clear him to work, so they just let him go. And now he, he's out of a job again. And so uh, a person like that might ask, how can I give thanks uh, for that? Uh, but that verse doesn't really say... Um, for everything give thanks. It says what? In everything give thanks. You see, we don't have to be thankful for the event that might take place in our life that we might look upon from our perspective as being bad. But in that event, we can know uh, that we can be thankful for it. And the reason we can be is because of this verse right here. And so really, uh, in everything give thanks. It says not for everything, but in everything. How many of you ever heard of Matthew Henry? You ever hear of Matthew Henry's commentary? You know why he wrote that commentary? He was a pastor's son, and he took really good notes from his father's preaching. And uh, through the years, he just kept adding on those notes and adding on those notes, and he decided to go through and just have a commentary on the Bible. And he was a Puritan. That was written in the 1600s. And we still use that commentary today, Matthew Henry's commentary. Well, he was once robbed by thieves, and he wrote these words in his diary after he was robbed. He said, first, let me be thankful because I was never robbed before. I'm thankful in that. Secondly, because although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, he said, I'm thankful because although they took all that I had, it wasn't much. And then fourth, I'm thankful that it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. That's an illustration of in everything, give thanks. He wasn't thankful necessarily that he was robbed, but he was thankful in that event. And again, we can say things like that because of this wonderful promise, the promise of God's providence that we see here in Romans 8, 28. Look at that verse. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, this is one of the greatest texts in all of Scripture. There's no other verse in the Bible that covers so much territory or conveys so much comfort as this one verse. And so that's why I want us to just think about it and just meditate on it tonight uh, with me. So 
Let me just give you five perspectives I want you to see from this verse. Five perspectives about the principle of providence, or we could say the promise of God's providence. Now, here's the first one. Just write down the certainty of it. If you're taking notes, write down the certainty of it. And look at it again. And we know. I want you to notice that this verse starts off with a ring of certainty. God doesn't say it's possible that all things can work together. He says we know. Now, the Greek word there is um, oda, which means absolute knowledge, positive knowledge, beyond any doubt. Uh, Again, he does not say there's a good chance of this thing working out for your good. No, that's not what he says. He says we know with certainty this is going to work out for your good. Now, this, this verb here is a perfect indicative and remember what I told you about Greek? How many of you remember your Greek lessons I've been teaching you? Anybody here? No, no hands are up. You all failed the course. Let me remind you again about Greek verbs. There's really four moods in Greek. There's the indicative mood, which is the mood of fact. This is going to happen. And then there is the subjunctive mood, which is the mood of a possibility. It may happen. It's possible. And then there's the mood, the imperative mood, which is a command. And then there's the optative mood, which is a wish. Now, the mood of this verse is not optative, it's not a wish, and the sense of it is, oh, I wish that all things will work together for good. No, that's not it. This is not a subjunctive mood. It's possible that all things work together for good. That's not the sense of this verse, but it is in the indicative mood, or we could say it like this, it is a fact that all things are going to work together for your good good. It's a fact. Isn't that good to know? God didn't say maybe. God said it's a fact. You might be going through a very difficult time right now, and you might be saying, man, it's hard to bear this, but you can take comfort in this. If you're a child of God, it's a fact that this is going to work together for you, for your good. I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of comfort. The certainty of this helps me. Now, the truth of the matter is, we may not see that, how, how God does that, on this side. Uh, We may not know that on this side of eternity, but I believe that one day when we get to heaven, we're going to see things from God's perspective, and we're going to say, you know what? Now I understand. Now I know. You know, sometimes we can know here on this side uh, that how God does it. You might, we have to give God time. You may go through a calamity right now. You're going through a difficulty. You might not understand that, that trial that you went through, that that, that tragedy that you had to endure, and you don't understand right now how this is working out for your good, it may be years down the road when you can look back and you can say, you know what, God, it makes sense now. I understand now. How many of you can say that? I mean, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you had something happen years ago? And, and, and far removed from it now, you can look back and you can say, you know what, I understand now why God did that the way he did. Uh, a man recommended a play to his friend. He said, this play is marvelous. He said, you'll love it. It's so uplifting. It's so exhilarating. You'll you'll be encouraged. And later on when he saw his friend, he said, how would you like it? He said, it was terrible. He said, what do you mean terrible? He said, well, he said uh, the kid was kidnapped. The father lost his job. The mother ended up in a hospital. It was depressing. And the man said, well, did you stay till the end? He said, no, I left after the second act. I couldn't take any more. He said, well, that's why. He said, you had to stay till the end and you had to wait until the end. It's at the end, it all worked out. And friend, listen, when you're going through a trial, don't give up on Almighty God. Just just stay faithful. Because in the end, God has given us this promise. It's all going to work out for good. Uh, I was over in England, and I visited a place called Smithfield. This is where Bloody Mary, the queen, would burn Protestant preachers at the stake. And there was a story, a famous story, told by Charles Spurgeon of a man who was Uh, arrested during the the, the reign of Queen Mary for preaching the gospel. He was condemned to burn at the stake there at Smithfield. And uh, on the way, and and by the way, when it was handed down to him, the uh, the arrest and the sentencing, uh, people asked him, how do you feel? And he quoted the verse, this very verse here. He said, all things work together for good. They said, how in the world is you being burned at the stake going to work together for good? He said, I don't know. But he said, I I believe that all things work together for good. Well, on the way to Smithfield, 
the soldiers treated this man so roughly that they threw him down and it broke his leg. And they laughed at him as he was there on the ground writhing in pain. And they said, how is this going to work together for your good? He said, I don't know. And so they took him to a place to get his leg taken care of and bandaged up. And because they did that, they arrived one day late at Smithfield. And during the delay, you know what happened? Queen Mary died and, and Queen Elizabeth took the throne and she pardoned this man from being burned at the stake. And as he walked past his guards, he said, all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, the truth of the matter is we may not see here sometimes on this side how that this verse applies, but we have to trust in the providential hand of God that he's going to work it all out. So we see, number one, the certainty of it. But I want you to write down, number two, the circumference of it. Because think about this, all things work together for good. Now, again, this is, this is mind-boggling to me. I mean, we would be comforted if, we, if the verse said some things work together for good. Some of the things you go through are going to work together for good, but that's not what it says. All things. You know what the word all means in the Greek? It means all. <laughs> all things. All things work together for good. This encompasses all the experiences of life, uh, all the good things, all the bad things, all the joys, all the sorrows. You know what I think about when I think about and I meditate on this? I think about Ecclesiastes chapter 3. You remember that passage where Solomon is listing uh, all the things that we experience in life? Let me read to you part of it. Ecclesiastes 1, to everything there is a season, a time to every purpose under heaven. And you know the rest of this, right? Time to be born, time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break it down, a time to build up. And if you read that whole passage, what you'll see there are 14 negative experiences that we go through in life. And then beside that, 14 positive experiences that we go through in life. And Solomon says that God in heaven, uh, he oversees providentially all of these things. None of these things are without significance. None of these things are empty experiences that we go through. God uses all of these things, a time to rent, a time to sow, a time to keep, a time uh, to give away, and so on. All of these experiences, Solomon says, God works all of this around. And then listen to what he says in Ecclesiastes 3.11. He says, he has made everything beautiful in his time. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like an Old Testament, Romans 8.28. Because what Solomon is saying is that God sovereignly allows, uh, oversees all of these experiences that we go through, and he mingles them all together, our, our burdens and our blessings, our joys and our sorrows. He brings them all together, and you know what he does? In his time, he makes them all beautiful, all these things. He just works it all together. And so it's all things. Again, I'm glad this verse does not say some things. God works all things together together for our good, so that we can be certain that whatever tragedy that we go through, we can know that God is going to work it all together. He's just going to work it together for good. Now, the Apostle Paul who wrote this didn't write this from an ivory tower. He wasn't one of those ivory tower theologians that does not experience the difficulties of life. Uh, you know, you know what the word scholar actually means in Latin? It means ease, life of ease. You know why people called scholars life of ease? These guys that would study books and stay in the halls of academia because it seemed like to some people that they had a life of ease. Just study and teach and live in your ivory tower and you don't experience the hardships of life. That's what a scholar is. It's someone who has a life of ease in the mind of a lot of people. Well, Paul was a brilliant man, but he didn't have a life of ease. He experienced all of these harsh realities. And Paul could catalog all the difficulties that he went through, the, uh, the hunger, the thirst, the loneliness, the sickness, the imprisonment, the robberies, the stonings, the scourgings, the shipwrecks, uh, the assassination attempts, the trials, all of those things Paul experienced. And it was Paul who said, you know what? This is all going to work together for good. 
It's all going to work. Let me give you an illustration of how Paul practices what he preaches, okay? Hold your place here in Romans 8. Go to Philippians chapter 1 real quick. Would you flip over there with me? Look at Philippians chapter 1. Paul wrote the book of Philippians. You remember that, right? And where was Paul when he wrote this letter? He was in prison, right? He was in a Roman prison. Uh, He was uh, allowed to have visitors visit him um, in that Roman prison. He was there for two years. He was waiting to appear before Caesar to give a defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And while Paul was there, uh, the Philippian church that he was very close to, I think that this was, of all the churches that Paul planted, this was probably one of the churches that was most beloved to him. And they were so very kind and generous to him and always supporting him. But there came a point in time where they didn't know where Paul was. And they were looking for him. And finally, they found him. They heard about him being in prison. And they heard about uh, some of the hardship that he had to face. Now, when you're in prison, uh, in the Roman world at that time, uh, people on the outside had to support you. Today, if a person goes to jail, uh, the state, taxes, pay for that person's, you get three square meals and, uh, and uh, cable TV, I hear, I don't know, I've never been in a prison, never stayed there. But so basically the taxpayer pays for the expenses of a prisoner in prison today, but in the Roman world, the Roman government didn't pay for your imprisonment. You had to be dependent upon the gifts of other people. And when the Philippians heard that Paul was in this Roman prison, they immediately got together a, a, a love offering, a gift, and they sent Epaphroditus to Rome to visit Paul, to give him this gift, to take care of him. And the book of Philippians is really a thank you letter. And when Epaphroditus gets to Rome and he sees Paul and he reports to Paul what's going on in the church and all the concern that they had over Paul, they were worried about him. And one of the big things that they were dealing with is why would God put his greatest preacher in prison for two years? Think about that. For two years, he'd been waiting there in that prison. Why would God do that? Why would God put his greatest apostle, his greatest preacher in a prison for two years? That's like taking your racehorse and locking him up in a barn. Uh, They couldn't understand that. And so Paul wants to alleviate their concerns. So look what he writes in chapter 1. Look down in verse number 12. Notice what he says there. But I would have you to understand, brethren, I want you to understand this, that the things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the what? Unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace. And the word for palace there is the Greek word praetoria. It's where... Uh, you get um, the title of Caesar's elite guards called the Praetorian Guards. And because you have to remember that when Paul was in that prison, it was kind of like a house prison, but he had a Roman soldier chained to him for six hours at a time. Every six hours, a new soldier would be chained to Paul. And uh, how would you like to be chained to the Apostle Paul for six hours? Talk about a seminary education a intensive study right there. And so Paul said, look, that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palaces. Look at verse 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So what's Paul doing? He's reminding them that what has happened to him, it's all working together for what? For good. Paul said, this isn't a bad thing that's happened to me. This is a good thing. Do you understand that Paul says to the Philippians that I am now sharing the gospel with people who would otherwise never really hear the gospel? The fact that I'm in this prison, the the gospel of Jesus Christ is spreading into the upper echelons of the Roman government, so much so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace or the praetorian guard, And the way I think about that is like this. A Roman soldier is chained to Paul, and this Roman soldier hears Paul pray. Uh, He hears Paul as he counsels people that come to visit him from the church at Rome. 
Uh, perhaps he hears Paul as he dicta dictates a few letters to some of the churches that are out there. And then you, you can rest assured that the Apostle Paul is going to give this soldier the gospel. How many you think that that happened? That absolutely happened. And when the, when the soldier's time was up after six hours, as his friend came, this guy went back to the, to the barracks and said, you'll never believe who I was with for the last six hours. And you know what he told me? Let me tell you what he told me. And you know what was happening? Some of those Roman soldiers were hearing the gospel, and they were getting saved, and they were taking that gospel back to the, their buddies, and they were sharing the gospel with them. And you know what? The word of God, the gospel, was spreading into that whole unit of soldiers that were hearing the word of God. And also think about this. Paul was actually going to go, and he was going to... Uh, uh, go to an official trial, court trial. It was Paul versus the Roman government, and he was going to stand before Caesar, and there had to be lawyers and attorneys that were preparing their case. And what did that mean? That means they had to understand the gospel that Paul was preaching. So they made a study of that. So what was happening? Paul was saying to the Philippians, from your perspective, it all looks bad. It all looks bad. I, here I am in prison. Uh, and staying here in this prison. But from my perspective, what I'm seeing is God working it all together for good. He's accomplishing his purpose in it. His captors were being evangelized. His colleagues were being emboldened. And there were more of the Christians in Rome that were hearing about Paul in prison. They were much more bold, Paul says, to speak the gospel. His critics were being exposed. His Christ was being exalted. Paul said, you know what? This is all working together for good. And this is a, a perfect illustration of Paul's belief in the providence of God. This is Paul saying to the Philippians, Romans 8, 28, it's all working together for good. It's all working together for good. Don't you worry about me. God's using this. And I am thrilled to see the gospel is making a pioneer advance. All is working together for good. Now, some of you might say, well, wait a minute. What about sin? You say all things work together for good. What about sin? You know, there may be some people here and you failed God. You may have sinned against God. And you're asking yourself, can God take the, my failure, my sin, and work it together for good? Is there any biblical warrant to believe that? And the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Let me ask you a question. What's the greatest sin that was ever committed? Think about this. It was the crucifixion of the Son of God. There was no one more holy, more innocent than the Lord Jesus Christ. No one who uh, that does, uh, was more mistreated, that faced injustice more than the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't deserve to be crucified, but the Bible says wicked hands laid hold of Jesus. Wicked hands crucified the Lord Jesus. And I want to tell you, friend, the greatest sin ever committed by man was the crucifixion of the Son of God. But let me ask you a question. Did God use that? Did God make that something that he could work together? Listen, what's the greatest blessing that ever happened to mankind? You see, what's the greatest thing that ever happened to mankind? I would tell you that the greatest blessing that ever took place on this world for man was the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, friend, without that, there would be no atonement. Without the crucifixion of the Son of God, the wrath of God would not be satisfied for our sins. We would still be in our sins. We would be on our way to hell. The greatest blessing that we've ever received is Jesus dying for our sins. And yet it was the greatest sin that was ever committed. So if you ask me, can God take sins and touch them and turn them around and work them together for good and make them a blessing, the answer to that is absolutely yes. Even our failures, even our sins, God can work them together for good, for our own benefit. And the suffering, the sufferings that you go through, God can work all of that out for our good. Let me give you just real quickly, kind of a side note, some benefits of suffering uh, and how that God can use even our sufferings 
for our own good. First of all, what does it do for us? It teaches us to hate sin. That's what suffering does. It teaches us to hate sin. The Puritan Thomas Watson wrote an entire book on Romans 8, 28, and this is one of the things he says. He says, affliction teaches what sin is. A sickbed often teaches more than a sermon. We can see the ugly visage of sin in the glass of affliction. But here's the second thing. It helps us to see our own evil. Sometimes um, our suffering is a result of what we have done, or just by virtue of the fact that we're suffering, we begin to see some of the leftover iniquity and sin that is in us. And friend, that's not a bad thing because what it does is it causes us to cry out to God because of our sin. It does a sanctifying work when our evil is exposed. But here's the third thing along with that. It drives us to God. Suffering forces us to stop focusing on the things of the world, the trivial things, to focus on the most important things, and it drives us to God. And here's the fourth thing. It conforms us to Christ. It conforms us to the image of Christ. Um, and then here's the fifth thing. It drives out sin. It drives the sin out. Um, Job said this, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. God is doing that purifying work. It also reveals that we are sons of God because God will allow the suffering to discipline us. And the Bible teaches that in, in Hebrews chapter 12. Not all of the discipline of God is because of our disobedience. A lot of times it's just God disciplining us because he's preparing us for something greater in our life. And we have to go through that, that, uh, that, that difficult time that discipline because God wants to use us in a greater way. And so, and on we could go. But let me, let me just move on to the third thing. Now, we said there's the certainty of this, we know. There is the circumference of it, all things. But here's the third thing. I, I call this the cooperation of it. The cooperation of it. Look at that promise again. And we know that all things work together for good. Work together is one word in the Greek, it is soon, which means with energeo, which is where we get our word energy. And really, this whole word together is where we get the English word synergy. And synergy is when two or more things interact to produce a result greater than the mere sum of its parts. In other words, it's just the old principle of teamwork. You can get more done working together with a team coming together than you can. We're glad you've joined us today for this broadcast of The Ever-Living Story a media outreach of Grace Bible Baptist Church in Catonsville, Maryland. It's our sincere prayer that this broadcast has touched the spiritual needs of your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into this world to change our lives, to bring us eternal life. And Grace is a local congregation where the Word of God is very clearly preached as you've just seen. We're located just off exit 17 of the Baltimore Beltway at 1518 North Rolling Road, Catonsville, Maryland. Let me leave you with this thought. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has changed your life, and He wants you to live out every day of it for His ever-living story.